It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. Speaker, government members have applauded the Premier's frequent use of his personal phone to conduct government business. A flagrant disregard for the Information and Privacy Commissioner's recommendation that the government members and political staff only use government devices and platforms. Speaker, this government should know the rules. In fact, that guidance came after the Premier's own staff were caught using personal email accounts to arrange for his souped-up van. My question is to the Premier. Did the Premier intentionally use his personal phone to communicate in secret with people who have business before the government? To reply, the Premier. Well, th thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. You can see where the NDP's priorities are. <laughs> Worrying about helping little Miss Jones on a pothole or helping someone find a doctor or so on and so forth. I'll tell you what our priorities are. Our priorities are making sure we cut taxes for people, reducing the gas by 10.7 cents, getting rid of the license plate sticker, cutting the tolls on the 412, 418, building hospitals in every region of this province, building the 413, and, and making sure that we're building the subway system. We're doubling the size of the transit system right here in Toronto and the GTA, Mr. Speaker. That's our priorities. Not worrying about little Miss Jones calling me about a pothole, that's for sure. Supplementary question. Speaker, uh, the Premier and the government may not like it, but the Auditor General made it very clear that any devices or accounts used for government business can be searchable by freedom of information requests even if it's a personal device. But, Speaker, the Premier has been singularly focused on hiding records of these phone calls and text messages. He is even appealing freedom of information requests to avoid sharing those records. Will the Premier withdraw his appeals of these FOI requests? The government House Leader, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I mean I would be careful if I was the NDP talking about hiding people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Uh, uh, I, I, I really, really would. Uh, Speaker, look, we earlier today announced that uh, the Minister of Finance announced the, uh, the date of the next uh, fall economic statement for hey. the province of Ontario. Hey. Right? So, and as the Premier has said, he's not going to stop working on behalf of his constituents, the Mrs. Jones who needs a, might need a doctor or a pothole filled in front of her home. He's not going to stop doing that because the Leader of the Opposition is demanding that he stop doing that. That is at the core of everything that this Premier and Ford Nation have been all about, Mr. Speaker. It's the same type of, it's the same type of talk that we heard before when his brother became uh, became the mayor, right? Never could happen. But you know why Ford Nation became uh, so important to the people of the province of Ontario? Because Spons? they actually pick up the phone, because they make the telephone calls, because they're accessible, and that is why this caucus has grown, and that is why that caucus has continued to shrink election after election after election. The final supplementary. Speaker. If there is nothing to hide, then why is the government working so hard to hide them from the public? What we do know is that a global news investigation found that the Premier didn't use his government uh, phone once during a whole one-week period in November, the exact period when the government decided to carve up the green belt. To the Premier. Did he use a personal device instead of an official government device to avoid access to freedom of information laws? Mr. Speaker, again, the Premier actually got up. One of the first things that he did in the House when he became Premier was got up and told the province of Ontario his phone number. He actually, in this House, gave his phone number out in Hansard. Uh, Mr. Speaker, reported in every single newspaper, the Premier has given out his phone number so that people can call him from all across the province. It might be why the people of this province trust this Premier to get things done for them, Mr. Speaker. It might be one of the reasons why. You know what, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is doing everything in her power to, to distract from the fact that she has a full-blown caucus revolt on her hands. And why, Mr. Speaker? Because she has failed on her first Brilliant. true test of leadership. When she had the opportunity Order. to stand up to the hard, the anti-Semitic hard left of her party, 
She refused to do anything about it. They looked at her and said, Response. we will not listen to you. Despite the fact that she said, something. take something down, apologize. When they said no, she cowered. Mr. Speaker, she failed the first true test, and it is why she will never be the Premier of this province. Order. 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 The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. We'll see about, we'll see about that, Speaker. Speaker, this government is Order. under criminal investigation by the RCMP for trying to enrich their friends and donors to the tune of more than $8 billion in the Greenbelt grab. One of the most important questions that requires further investigation, what did the Premier know? When did he know it? My question to the Premier is, what is he hiding on his personal phone about the Greenbelt grab? Speaker, is the leader of the opposition for real? Like they've actually deposited a opposition day. They get eight or eight opportunities to hold or lead debate in this place, and they're talking about a telephone record. Well, I'd ask you to go back into Hansard. You can get his phone number, and you too can call the Premier of the Province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. He's very generous with his time. He might even give you advice on how you can uh, uh, lead your party a little bit better. He's had <laughs> incredible success over here. But we're talking about the things that matter to the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Right. We have a fall economic statement that will set the agenda for the budget in uh, next year's budget, Mr. Speaker. We're opening pre-budget consultations because we want to focus, continue to focus on the priorities of the people of the province of Ontario. Response. We want to continue to grow the economy. We want even more than the 700,000 who already have the dignity of a job. We want to grow that number, Mr. Speaker. We would like the opposition to help us participate, give us ideas. I doubt they would. Remind the members to make the comments to the chair. Leave the opposition. Supplement. Speaker, we found out last week that the uh, Auditor General has launched yet another investigation, this time into potential abuse of ministerial zoning orders. It's the same story over and over and over again with this government, rigging the system to help a select few of their insider friends get even richer. Preferential treatment at the expense of taxpayers. So I'm going to ask again of the Premier, what is he hiding on his personal phone about these suspicious land deals? Members, <laughs> please take their seats. Government House Leader. Speaker, the use of MZOs has been an important tool in helping us meet the priorities of the people of the province of Ontario. In fact, we have used MZOs and we will continue to use MZOs to build long-term care homes. We have used MZOs at the request of the City of Toronto to build affordable and social housing in the communities represented by the NDP. Now, they are against that use, Mr. Speaker, but we will continue to use the MZO. I have a request on my desk from Sick Kids Hospital, from the Mayor of, uh, of Toronto, uh, Olivia Chow, to use an MZO to ensure that the orange helicopter space is preserved and protected. It is my intention to do just that, Mr. Speaker. I will let them. I will let them explain why they are against using MZOs to further the priorities of the people of the province of Ontario, to protect the people of the province of Ontario. We will continue to do it when it is in the best interest of the people of the province Spons? of Ontario. That is why we are building a bigger, better, safer Ontario, and they are against that every step of the way. The final supplementary. Uh, I, 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 what, what is on that phone, Speaker? You know, that's what the people want to know. Something doesn't smell right here. And, Speaker, I submitted a new Integrity Commissioner complaint yesterday about what appears to be an inappropriate relationship between a former government minister and a land speculator. But it begs the question, is this the standard operating procedure for this government? Did the member from Mississauga East Cooksville just get caught? Mr. Speaker, the public deserves to know. What would we find on the Premier's personal phone about this government's secret backroom deals? I, I, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that in the, the many years that I've been privileged to, uh, to serve uh, uh, as, a, as a parliamentarian, this is the saddest spectacle of any leader of the opposition that I have ever seen. We are faced with some very important issues across, the, across not only Ontario, but across the world right now. Later on today, we will be voting on a motion of support for the people of Israel against a terrorist attack. The opposition have literally said nothing on this. Hours and hours of debate, they have sat on their hands. The leader of the opposition had her first 
true test of leadership and has failed so miserably. She's doing anything to distract that she's talking about 411 records on somebody's phone, Mr. Speaker, as opposed to focusing on what matters to the people of the province Order of Ontario. Back. She's trying to do anything to distract Response. from the full-on revolt that she has in her party. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to focus on what matters to the people of the province of Ontario. Later today, she'll have an opportunity to vote with us. I hope that she does. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, earlier this week, the government shut down our motion to cancel the really sketchy Ontario Place deal. You'll remember this deal will see more than $600 million of hard-earned public funds subsidize the private profits of an Austrian spa developer for 95 years. You'll remember that this deal, uh, the people of this province do not support this deal. The deal makes no sense. What could possibly justify this unprecedented giveaway of prime waterfront property and hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars to Therma? Maybe we should ask Carmen Negro, chair of Ontario Place and a close personal friend of the Premier. My question to the Premier is, what would we find on his personal phone about the Ontario Place deal? To apply for the government, the Minister of Infrastructure. The member opposite is speaking to, yes, a, a property prime location, absolutely. A property that had to be closed in 2017 because of severe flooding that even impacted Budweiser stage operations. No. The site is in complete disrepair. It is constantly flooding, which is why we are doing the site servicing work, it's underway, and, while, and that is exactly why we will repair the shoreline to make sure we protect the island for years and years so that people can enjoy it in the future. Yeah. You. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, Carmen Negro is only one of many of this Premier's friends who have been given very lucrative positions across this province's agencies, boards and commissions. And there are a frightening number of those appointees who appear to be entirely unqualified for this job. The appointment of people whose only qualification seems to be a big enough donation to the Conservative Party, and that calls into question the competence and integrity of vital services like the Landlord and Tenant Board and the Human Rights Tribunal. The people of Ontario want to know, and so do I, how many of these unqualified appointees would we find on the Premier's personal phone logs? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much. Maybe the Leader of the Official Opposition should inquire about the 2018 procurement led by the Liberal government, which also had a top proponent, and that top proponent's name was Thermae. Thermae is building a wellness centre and a water park facility to the Leader of the Opposition. Two different procurements by two different governments with different criteria. Proponent is the same. Thermae will be at Ontario Place and will offer water park play for families 365 days of the year. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brantford Brands. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Great, Minister. Across Great. the world, economic challenges continue to grow, and we know that Ontario is not isolated from this geopolitical uncertainty. We recently heard the great news during public accounts that our government received a sixth straight clean audit from the Auditor General. This is a refreshing change from the fiscal mismanagement of the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP. Unfortunately, Speaker, many families and individuals in my riding and across our province are feeling the economic pressures that have been caused by ongoing supply chain disruptions, inflation, and increased interest rates. The people of our province are looking to our government for leadership during these times of uncertainty. Speaker, can the minister please address this House on how our government is providing much-needed fiscal leadership for the people of Ontario? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hard-working member from Brantford Pratt for that question. As highlighted by the recent Ontario economic accounts, the numbers are 
of our province economy remain resilient. But as we've said before, Ontario faces potential economic uncertainty ahead. That's why, Mr. Speaker, as we continue to build more homes, more hospitals, more schools, and more transit, investing in better services and keeping costs down for the people of Ontario, we are doing so in a prudent and responsible way. And I'm pleased to inform the House that we will, be, we will be releasing our government's fall economic statement just a few weeks from now, on November 2nd. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> this government will continue to make targeted investments to support families, to support workers, and to support businesses today while laying a strong fiscal foundation for future generations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It's great to hear that the fall economic statement will be released in the coming weeks. The people of Ontario look forward to hearing an update on our government's plan for our economy. The Minister spoke about the fact that Ontario is not exempt from factors that are contributing to global economic uncertainty. That is why our government must show leadership and demonstrate a strong economic vision and plan that will help families and individuals during this unpredictable financial period. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is continuing to work on behalf of Ontarians during these challenging economic times? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Finance. Thank you again to the great member from Bradford Grant for that question, Mr. Speaker. In the fall economic statement 2023, we continue to will continue to deliver on government's plan to build as we continue to work on building a stronger, more resilient Ontario with targeted investments in critical infrastructure. And as we've seen over the last year and the last few months, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's population continues to grow. Almost 500,000 people last year, over 15.6 million people that call Ontario home. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, that we are building Ontario. That's why we're building in Durham for Bowmanville a four more transit stations and transit-oriented communities, Mr. Speaker. That's why up in Sault Ste. Marie at the Algoma Steel Plant, where they're going to be building and completing a clean steel manufacturing operation due to open in November of 2024. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, in the West Niagara region, we are building a new hospital that they've been asking for for almost three decades, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to supporting the people of Ontario, and we will build Ontario together. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetnong. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, question to the Premier. Um, Things are different in Northern Ontario. Things are different in Kiwetnuk. Things are different in on reserve. But since I've been here, since I've become a member, I've talked about many issues that need to be improved on reserve. Housing, fire safety, education, mental health, clean drinking water. It is a systemic racism to do nothing and let these conditions worse, get worse. Will this government acknowledge that they have a responsibility to improve these conditions in First Nations. <laughs> Minister for Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, first and foremost, I want to welcome the members from the isolated communities here today that I've had an opportunity to, to live in, especially Casa Bonica, one of my favourite communities. Mr. Speaker, we see these as opportunities. We acknowledge that there remain some challenges around things like legacy infrastructure uh, for isolated communities. But when it gets right down to it, Mr. Speaker, we have an extraordinary opportunity to work with those communities to open up corridors for electricity, road access to pr improve the health, economic and social uh, conditions of those communities, Mr. Speaker. Increasingly, leadership from those communities are coming to us to have those conversations and develop real opportunities and create real opportunities through my ministries and other ministries in this government to change the fortunes and the, the, Response. the, the, the roadmap to prosperity, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to continue that conversation with that member and the leadership uh, across uh, Northern Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, uh, it's not prosperity when you have young girls dying by suicide, when you have young boys dying by suicide. That's not prosperity. But chiefs of, uh, chiefs, uh, 31 chiefs in the uh, Sulikaud area 
the Sulik Code, as part of the Sulik Code First Nations Health Authority, have declared a public and social emergency because of the disproportionate mental health and addiction issues in the North. The cost of doing nothing, because Ontario uses jurisdiction as an excuse, costs lives and health every day, every day, Speaker. Will this government acknowledge that colonialism is a determinant of health for First Nations people? To reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank uh, the member opposite for the opportunity to answer this question. We know that there are gaps in care, and they're wider in Indigenous communities. And since 2019, we've invested over $40 million annually in Indigenous care organizations through the Roadmap to Wellness. We've strengthened partnerships with community-based organizations doing incredible work, $4.2 million to open 37 treatment beds in Sioux Lookout, $3.8 million St. Joseph's Self Care uh, and, and De La Co Anishinaabek Family Care, 34 new treatment and medical withdrawal management beds, $1.7 million to expand beds for KCA youth camps, youth mental wellness service programs, $13.5 million across government with 30 projects aimed at stopping the cycle of intergenerational trauma, two new and expanded treatment and healing centres in Northern Ontario through Roadmap to Wellness. Mr. Speaker, we know we need to do better in Indigenous communities, and we're working in partnership to build appropriate, culturally appropriate mental health and addiction supports and services for all the people of Ontario, including Indigenous. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Every region in Ontario is experiencing a labour shortage. More workers are needed to deliver on our government's plan to build homes, schools, roads, and other critical infrastructure. That is why our government must develop a workforce to take on these important projects. In Northern Ontario, many businesses, supply chains, and industries are expanding. That is why more people in First Nation communities must be connected with well-paying, in-demand jobs in the skilled trades that are close to their home. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is providing accessible training for First Nations communities to Question. prepare for careers in the skilled trades? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. 700,000, Speaker. That's how many more people woke up today with a paycheck thanks to the leadership here, here. of this Premier. And, Speaker, one of the most successful funds to get people into those jobs, to upskill, to get bigger paychecks, is our Skills Development Fund. And I was proud uh, to be in Northern Ontario, a place my Liberal predecessor called No Man's Land. I was proud to be up there to announce $7.3 million investment through the Skills Development Fund to help, to help 1,700 people find better jobs, bigger paychecks, and I was honoured to meet with a number of Indigenous youth and a number of Indigenous men and women who are going to be beneficiaries of the Skills Development Fund, who are going to be supported uh, speaker, into getting bigger jobs, better paychecks, and to support the skills development in those growing communities in the North. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. This is great news. By continuing to invest in our province labour force, we can achieve a strong Ontario build for the next generation. It is clear that under the leadership of the Premier, our government is bringing opportunities to every corner of our province. As communities and businesses in northern Ontario continue to grow, workers must be prepared for in-demand careers with local employees. That is why our government must take action to break down barriers so that workers can have rewarding careers and are close to home. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is developing a sustainable workforce in Northern Ontario and the Indigenous communities? Minister of Labour. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again. You know, the Minister of Northern Development just asked me if my riding was in Northern Ontario, and I think it's reflective of the outlook this entire government has. We recognize that there is no success in Ontario without unlocking the potential that is Northern Ontario. So, yes, I'm proud to represent Northern Ontario as well. And, and Speaker, 17,000, I'll give you another number, 17,000 jobs go unfilled in Northern Ontario in construction, in health care, in tourism, in logging, in mining. Well, Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier, we've invested almost a billion dollars through the Skills Development Fund to help people get a leg up. But what's most exciting is that these projects are led by partners in the North. They're led by partners unions, for example, who've been beneficiaries of this. I was with iron workers in the north to announce that $7.3 million, and I heard Phil's story. Phil was at a Safeway. He was wondering, uh, working dirty jobs, low pay, and thanks to the Skills Development Fund, he now has a, big, a better job and a bigger paycheck. We're transforming lives in the north. We're unlocking the potential. It's no longer no man's land. We're unlocking that potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. The member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. Businesses in my riding of St. Paul's and the community they serve have suffered because of delay after delay of the Eglinton Crosstown P3 project. These businesses have not been compensated for these delays, although we've asked many times of this government. But the P3 contractor has been rewarded with $100 million bailouts paid by the public. Metrolink CEO Phil Verster has been rewarded with huge raises and just had his contract extended. We might as well call him the million-dollar man. My question is back to the Premier. Uh, why are the people responsible for this fiasco getting rewarded while business people in St. Paul's and, frankly, elsewhere are left to suffer by this Conservative government? Thank you, Speaker. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Transportation to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here are the facts. We are making the largest investment in public transit in the history of this province. Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, over $30 billion are being invested in the city of Toronto. And that member and the members from the Toronto uh, team on the, the member of the, uh, the party of the opposition have voted against key projects in transit. They voted against the Ontario line. They voted against the Scarborough subway extension. They voted against LRTs across this province. They don't want to build transit in cities like Toronto. They don't want to build transit in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We will take no lessons from them and continue on our path to making sure the people of Ontario can move, whether it's through transit or highways. The supplementary question. Speaker, Phil Verster won't hold the P3 contractor accountable for cost overruns and delays to the Eglinton Crosstown. Instead, he paid the P3 contractor hundreds of millions of dollars in bailouts that the Auditor General said should not have been paid. The, the Metrolinks board won't hold Mr. Verster accountable. Instead of firing him, they want to give him another raise and pay him over a million dollars per year. The Premier won't hold the Metrolinks board accountable. Instead, he keeps stacking the board with cronies and PC donors. Where's the transparency and the accountability in that? Again, back to the Premier, if he'd only answer the question, who will finally hold the Premier accountable for the Metrolinks gravy train? RCMP, maybe? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I will tell you what the Premier is doing, and that is building the subway system, expanding the subway system by 50% in the City of Toronto Order. and York Region. He's also building public transit in other communities, like Mississauga and the Huron Ontario line. Order. But, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Government House Leader come to order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. I need to be able to hear the Minister of Infrastructure respond to the question. Start the clock. Minister of Infrastructure has the floor. Mr. Speaker, everyone is aware that we inherited the Eglinton Crosstown project. We do not contract projects in the same way anymore. But since 2018, Mr. Speaker, 27 P3 projects are in construction today. Wow. 27. It is this premier that will build they this province. Stop the clock. 
The member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Ottawa South. Next question. Thank you Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, last week Ontarians got some news that comes as a relief for many. The news that the RCMP is launching an investigation into the failed $8.3 billion back, backroom dealer, deal that was going to benefit wealthy, well-connected insiders, or by the Premier's own admission, his friends. Cabinet ministers, senior political staffers have already been interviewed by the Integrity Commissioner, and it's clear from his report that they all lawyered up. And as the Premier knows, lawyers are expensive. So can the Premier tell us today that not one penny of taxpayer dollars for any government members or staffers caught up in this $8.3 billion scandal will be spent? You reply, the government house leader. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is a member who replaced a leader whose chief of staff the members of his party went to jail. To jail, Mr. Speaker. This is a, a member. Order. This is a member who has a leadership candidate Order. who still wants to build on the green belt. Oh, yeah. Mr. Speaker, this is a member who, under their watch, saw the province lose thousands of jobs, hundreds, gave up on manufacturing, Mr. Speaker, didn't build long-term care, ruined our hospital sector, Mr. Speaker destroyed education, Terrible. starved post-secondary education, couldn't build transit, didn't build roads, Mr. Speaker. On every single count, they failed. And now for two elections in a row, Response. even the NDP have beaten them at the yeah. polls, Mr. Speaker. Saying and that's saying something, Mr. Speaker. So we'll continue to do what's right for the people of the province of Ontario, grow the economy. And the supplementary question, back to the member for Ottawa South. Well, you know, the House Leader can talk and talk and talk, yes, but he can. Yes, he can. <laughs> but sleep easy, Premier, the Mounties always get their man. The Premier's principal secretary, Amin Masoudi. The Premier's director of housing, Jay Truesdell. The Premier's hand-picked chief of staff in the Minister of Housing's office, Ryan Amato. The Premier's executive assistant, Nico fadani Diker, are all caught up in this. So we know that members of the government, former cabinet ministers, senior staffers in the ministers in the Premier's office, are all, and the Premier himself, are all likely to be questioned by the RCMP in this investigation. And folks, they're all going to need a lawyer. So Ontario taxpayers want to know that none of their hard-earned Taxpayer dollars will go for any members of this government, any political staffers Question. caught up in this scandal. Can the Premier commit to that today? Please rise in your seat and tell Ontarians that. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not across the floor. Government House Leader. Just, Mr. Speaker, honestly, we said we made a public policy decision that the people of the province of Ontario didn't support. Right? So we made a public policy decision, the people of the province didn't support. We then changed course, the Premier apologized. Now what we didn't do is what the previous Liberal government did. Right? They then paid billions of dollars to try and help their members win elections on a public policy decision that nobody supported. Remember the gas plant scandal? Right? That scandal Order. actually cost the people of the province of Ontario billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. In that party, people went to jail, Mr. Speaker. That party has been reduced. Off the clock. I apologize to the government house leader for having to interrupt him because it's the conservative side that is so loud I can't hear him. Please start the clock. Government House Leader still has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, here's the reality. 
both parties. You have an opposition, official opposition party who are hiding half of their caucus today. Yeah. They have a complete leadership revolt happening there. You have a Liberal Party that hasn't had a permanent leader now in five years, Mr. Speaker, and you have the people of the province of Ontario showing their support for the policies of the progressive Conservative government time and time again, because you know what they're concerned about? They're concerned about jobs. They're concerned about their economy. They're concerned about housing, education. They're concerned about their seniors. They're concerned about long-term care and health care, and on every single measure, we are making progress like we have never seen before. And, stop, stop. and I will remind members once again that we, it's not appropriate, nor do we permit um, a member making reference to the absence of another member. The next question, start the clock. The member for Carleton. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Red Tape Reduction. Ontario's businesses are a key part of Ontario's economy. They play a vital role in driving innovation, creating jobs, and fostering vibrant communities across our province. Our government must be focused on removing burdens that impact their operations. Taking action to reduce red tape supports our small businesses through direct cost savings, which, in turn, fuels job creation and growth. Businesses expect our government to follow through on our commitments and leave no stone unturned when it comes to cutting red tape. Speaker, through you. Can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to help businesses remain competitive? Thank you. Minister for Red Tape Production. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague uh, from Carleton for that important question. Mr. Speaker, our government is supporting Ontario's competitiveness by keeping costs down. One of the most important ways to do that is, Mr. Speaker, eliminating unnecessary red tape, of course. The actions that we have taken to cut red tape has helped Ontario businesses save nearly $950 million each and every year. Thanks to our efforts, the 11 different red tape reduction packages, we have removed 11. over 16,000 different kinds of red tape pieces, Mr. Speaker, to keep our businesses competitive at the world stage, Mr. Speaker. And the results speak for themselves. Mr. Speaker, there are over 700,000 people that are working today, Mr. Speaker, that were not under Spons. the previous Liberal and supported by the NDP government, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, back to the member for Carlton. Thank you to the minister for that response. It's clear that significant success has been achieved in making life easier for businesses in my riding of Carlton and across the province of Ontario through the, red, through the Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act. Reducing red tape is an important part of building a stronger economy and making it clear that Ontario is open for business. We are achieving results and seeing success, all without compromising public safety and environmental protections. However, there's still more to do in creating an environment that drives new investment and growth across the economy. Speaker, through you, can the minister please elaborate on what actions our government is taking to deliver better services for people and reduce costs for businesses? Thank you. Mr. Red Tape Production. Mr. I want to thank the uh, member for that question again. Mr. Speaker, we're working across government to remove unnecessary red tape that, of course, creates challenges for businesses All and people for the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Again, thanks to our efforts over the last five years, Ontario businesses are now saving nearly $950 million in each and every year, Mr. Speaker. Later today, I will be introducing our 12th red tape reduction package, Mr. Speaker. It will continue our government's effort to make sure our businesses are positioned to succeed and are competitive in the world, Mr. Speaker. It will show that our government is working around the clock to get it done, driving economic development, encouraging Keep job going, creation, please. and Fonts. demonstrate why Ontario is the best place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank well, you, Mr. Well, Speaker. Well, Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Island. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Premier. My office has received several calls from mothers desperate for help. They've told me about their daughters who have had psychotic episodes, been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Faced with the unknown, these families have tried everything in an endless loop of referrals, which go nowhere. 
When their children are left isolated and alone overnight with minimal interaction, they often go, get released from hospitals with no supports, no follow-up, and the worst possible scenario, released to homelessness. Speaker, when will the Premier give these families the attention they need instead of focusing on his insider friends? To reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. And uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question. I mean, this is a, a very important issue for our government. We understand the importance and the needs of children and youth and ensuring that supports and services are there for them. We developed the Roadmap to Wellness and, starting in 2019, invested $130 million in the children and youth mental health services through the Roadmap. The roadmap slates another $170 million over three years. In education, $90 million for school-based supports and $20 million for an, an across-the-board 5% funding increasing, something that has not been seen before by previous, from previous governments. And we're extremely proud of the youth wellness hubs that we've developed, 22 of them across the province of Ontario, making a huge difference in the lives of so many of our young people. And Mr. Speaker, Bonds. we're continuing to invest with early interventions to keep kids from harmful behaviors that are giving us a great return, easily accessible care, investments. Thank you very much. A supplementary question, back to the member for Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, respectfully, uh, back to the, the Premier, but to the Minister, I wasn't speaking of children. I was speaking of adults in a system that is absolutely in a, a horrifying mess, and we see that in all of our communities. I also wanted to bring a message uh, to the Premier today from Kitchener Centre about their struggle with the access to mental health care. One constituent wrote, and, I'll, and I quote, the provincial government keeps touting its investments in health care and its focus on mental health for young people, but what is actually being done? To, it seems to me to be that all that is being done is a fancy press release, while single moms like me have to figure out how to make it work and more often have to live with the guilt of not being able to provide my teen with the care they need to become a healthy and productive citizen." End of quote. So can the Premier tell us if he will stop spending hundreds of millions of dollars Question. on parking garages in a spa for downtown Toronto, instead start investing in mental health care in Kitchener and across the province. Associate Minister for members of please take their seats. Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Speaker, and thanks again for the opportunity to stand up. I started speaking about children and youth because we know that prevention is the key to ensuring that we have a system that's going to be functional for the adults and for everyone else in the system. But you know, Mr. Speaker, I've, I sit here in the, in the, in the, at this side of the House and I listen to some of the rhetoric from the other side, and I wonder if they've Order. stopped for a moment to think about what they did when they were in power and how they permitted another government to do absolutely nothing. Under their watch, Mr. Speaker, 9,645 beds, hospital beds for mental health were closed. Now, Mr. Speaker, our government, with $90 million, opened 400 new beds, 7,000 treatment spots, and we're continuing to build a continuum of care to look after the needs of everyone in the province of Ontario to ensure they get the help they get where and when they need it, no matter where they are in the province, the north, the south, the east, or the west. Okay, the, next question. the next question. The member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. When I connect with seniors in my riding of Ajax, they tell me that isolation is a major concern. The minister has always said it is the number one enemy for seniors. Thanks to the commitment of the Premier and this minister, investments made by our governments are helping seniors stay active, healthy and socially connected. In my community of Ajax, several organizations have received funding from this government to provide opportunities for seniors to get together, learn and stay active. Our government is making excellent progress in helping our seniors stay connected. However, we must continue to support initiatives that will help to keep our older adults engaged in their communities. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is supporting the quality of life for seniors in Ontario? Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. 
I said, thank you to the hardworking MPP for Ajax. <laughs> we have invested over $70 million since 2018 to fund nearly 300 senior active living centers across Ontario. As a senior myself, I know what a difference it makes to be surrounded by people and to have activities to look forward to. When I get to go out across the province and spend time with other seniors, I see the important role this senior center have. They are building network for seniors, bringing people together, and preventing loneliness. Response. These centers promote life in the community and support the health and well-being of a senior across Ontario. Thank you. Beautiful. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Senior active centers are a vital network for seniors and communities across the province. Thanks to the excellent programs and services that are offered, I often hear from seniors in my community that they're grateful for these spaces to gather and connect. These centers are vital investments into the health and well-being of our seniors and are also important for generations to come. Without these spaces, the health of seniors will be negatively impacted. That is why our government cannot afford to lose focus on the importance of programs and services that reduce social isolation. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting senior centers and organizations in communities across Ontario? The minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to share with the House that over $3 million has been dis distributed this past quarter for 299 senior active living centers across the province. This is a part of the funding received each quarter toward the maintenance and operating expenses for the centers. This is how we make sure that local organizations regularly have what they need to support seniors from ages to Etikokan, Kingston, Kearney, Wasaga Beach to Whitby seniors have access to these programs right in their community. These centers are a vibrant Spons. place for people to gather, get active, and feel support close to home. Thank you. Beautiful, Raina. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, a report last month from the Ontario Real Estate Association quoted CEO and former PC leader Tim Hudak uh, saying, quote, uh, student debt is not merely a financial burden, it's the biggest barrier to the dream of home ownership for many young Ontarians and their families. The report stated that students with debt want to own homes, but they are losing hope. Seventy percent are worried it will never happen, and students Student loans are the main reason. Speaker, this government's changes to OSAP have left more students drowning in debt than ever before. Why is this government denying post-secondary students the dream of home ownership? Mr. Colleges and Universities. And thank you to the member for that question. Actually, uh, after question period, I'm heading down to the college fair, and I'll be meeting with the students, the faculty, and uh, colleges, but also with the, our team from OSAP, and hearing directly from those folks who are working on the ground, dealing directly with students. But you know, what's interesting is under the former Liberal government, this province had the highest tuition in Canada. Shameful. But it was our premier who said no more. In 2018, we decreased tuition by 10 percent. We want tuition to be affordable for all students across the province, and that's why we continued to freeze that tuition. And we've kept OSAP as a needs-based assessment that, so that students in 10, 15, 20 years will have access to the OSAP system. In 2021 alone, we invested $4.2 billion in direct Spons. aid to 385,000 full-time students, with 80 per cent of Ontario's funding provided as grants, opposed to the 54 per cent of federal student supports. The supplementary question. 
Speaker, all this government has done is destabilize the post-secondary sector. Uh, listen to OREA. Listen to what uh, Tim Hudak is saying. The OREA report found that 42 percent of students carrying debt are considering leaving Ontario after graduation so they can repay their student loans and find a place of their own. This represents a huge loss to our province, but it can be easily fixed. Make OSAP easier to access. Convert loans to grants. That is how to make the dream of home, home ownership a reality for young people. Why did this government think that selling off the Greenbelt to enrich their friends was a more important housing strategy than giving young people the ability to afford to buy a home? The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this is the same party that opposes building student housing on campuses and in communities across Ontario. Yes. So we'll take no lessons from the, the party across. We've extended, extended the uh, OSAP program to be eligible for students who are enrolled in Indigenous institutions and micro-credentials so that more and more students can have access to OSAP. But because it's a need-based program, we've actually seen a decrease in the number of students who are accessing the uh, OSAP program. And it's initiatives like the Ontario Learn and Stay program, which is seeing free tuition for students who are enrolling in nursing programs, paramedic programs, and lab tech programs across the province. They are receiving free tuition in exchange for working in areas of uh, high needs uh, following graduation. It's ensuring that students who are um, attending colleges have access to three-year degrees at colleges, increasing the number of degrees in colleges so students Fonts. can continue to learn closer to home. So we are seeing a decrease in the number of students using those programs. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Oh, great With more than 100,000 unfilled jobs in the skilled trades, it's critical that we attract more women and underrepresented populations into the workforce to pursue good-paying careers in this sector. It's good news that employment numbers for women continue to rise, and more mothers are part of Ontario's labour market. However, the reality is that many women encounter barriers that make it difficult for them to enter the workforce. That's why our government must continue to work on behalf of all women to implement measures that will reduce obstacles. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please describe what actions our government is taking to support women in the workforce? Good question. The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Burlington for the work that you're doing, not just to see women survive, but to thrive. And so, Mr. Speaker, the FAO report is actually saying that we've done significant work to see more women entering the workforce because of the actions of our government, because we know that women are an integral part to the development of Ontario's economy. Yeah. And the FAO study found that the labour participation rate of mothers with children between the ages of zero to five years increased from 7.6% in 2021 to 78.9% in 2022. That's a 2.4 increase in one year under our government, and it's the first time we've seen an increase since 1976. Yeah. Our government secured a historic agreement for child an agreement that is better than any other province across the province, a billion extra dollars and additional year, a year of funding guaranteed that no other province had. Mr. Speaker, we know that women are Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is determined to support and empower women with economic opportunities. Bringing affordable childcare is a step in the right direction and will have a positive impact on helping to get more women in the workforce. Ontario's economy and our province as a whole will benefit by supporting women in the workforce, especially in leading edge industries such as skilled trades occupations. Unfortunately, the, women, the number of women employed in this sector is well below their male counterparts. At a time of severe labour shortages, our government must invest in programs that will help women to achieve the success they deserve. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is expanding opportunities for women to find careers in the skilled trades? The Associate Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, you know, our government has been making significant strides in encouraging women to enter the skilled trades. As our Minister of Labour has said before, we've seen a 30 per cent increase in women entering the skilled trades, and we intend to keep them there. Mr. Speaker, our government has invested in our Investing in Women's Futures program, and we've seen an expansion of this program to 10 new sites. <laughs> and uh, just recently, I was in Newmarket Aurora with the wonderful local member there, where we announced the expansion of the Investing in Women's Futures program to the Women's Centre of York Region with an investment of over $325,000 for their first step program. This program will address the intersectional economic and personal barriers that women have to overcome. It will offer over 250 women each year the services they need to leave abusive situations and develop economic opportunities for them to thrive. Speaker, that's why we have expanded our Women's Economic Security Program, and these programs together have seen over 10,000 women access the supports. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we are not going to leave women behind because we know that women... Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sutton. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, like most people on the chair, I'm very concerned about the current state of our health care system. This week, we heard from a family in Ajax who waited several hours for an ambulance. Hours for an ambulance, Speaker. This is a new low. It is unacceptable that anyone in Ontario in need of urgent emergency care has to wait for hours before the ambulance arrives to bring them to the hospital. The son who called the ambulance and waited with his father for hours said, and I'm quoting here, Speaker, our health care system is in a permanent state of collapse. It didn't have to be like this. I blame the Ford government 100 per cent. To the Premier, Speaker. Why are families waiting hours for an ambulance? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Frankly, it's because um, our health care system was ignored for too long when the uh, Liberals were in power and you were propping them up. But specifically, I want to talk about some short, medium and long-term goals that we have already put in place. Now, Speaker, we have a plan and it is working. In, in fact, in Northern Ontario, we now have a paramedic learn and stay program that ensures individuals who want to train to be a paramedic and serve in communities that need that additional assistance get the ability to do that with two years training. We cover their tuition and their books and they ensure that they are practicing in Northern communities, including your own. Those are the initiatives that we are working on. I would ask respectfully why you did not support the Learn and Stay program yeah, well, when it was well, voted. Well, 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 well. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Sudbury. Thanks, Speaker. Like the Liberals before them, the Conservatives tried to ble blame the previous party. They had five years to fix it. It got worse. The last time they were in power, they closed 26 hospitals and laid off 6,000 nurses. <laughs> Speaker, people waiting for ambulances, this is not an isolated event. Many other Ontarians have shared similar experiences. Don't laugh at all people waiting for ambulances. One family in Markham shared that their child had a sports injury and they waited hours before the ambulance arrived. That's not a laughing matter. Wait times like that can have lasting damage on the children. To the Premier, will you increase municipal funding for EMS and ambulances to ensure people are not left waiting in their times of need? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I would remind the member opposite that, in fact, our government is a 50-50 partner with municipal um, individuals who wish to expand their paramedic services. We have always been there, had the backs of our municipal partners as they expand their paramedic services. Having said that, we have done some things in the short term that have made a real difference, and that, of course, is, as an example, 911 models of care. So that individuals who do not need to go from a paramedic service into an emergency room have options available to them. As we roll out those programs, as communities apply for that, we, we have seen a dramatic increase in satisfaction at the patient level, and more importantly, making sure that individuals who use those 911 models of care so that, that they can go to a palliative Response. care, they can go to a long-term care home, they can go to uh, serve in uh, and mental health facilities have the option to do that. 
and the patients love it and the paramedics love it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Solicitor General. Sadly, there's a concerning rise in criminal activity across the country. Here in Ontario, we're seeing more and more reports of crime in all parts of our province. This has left many feeling troubled about the safety and security for themselves and their loved ones. Speaker, we all know that these trends cannot continue. Everyone in Ontario has a right to feel safe in their communities. That's why our government must continue to show leadership by addressing this disturbing surge in criminal activity that is negatively impacting every one of us. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what actions our government is taking to enhance public security across the province? General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member from Chatham, Kent Leamington, is 100 per cent right. Yes. Innocent people have lost their lives due to the dangerous criminals being on our streets instead of being behind bars. And that's why Ontario is leading the way. And thanks to Premier Ford, who coalesced all the premiers and territorial leaders in our country to pen a letter to the Prime Minister calling on the federal government to enact meaningful bail reform. Their bill, the federal bill C-48, has now passed the House of Commons and is on the way to be passed, we hope soon, in the Senate. But we're not just standing by, Mr. Speaker. We're strengthening the province's bail enforcement and prosecutorial system with a $112 million investment Response. to keep these high-risk offenders and those who will wreak havoc on our streets in jail behind bars where they belong. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Solicitor General. It's reassuring to hear about the progress our government has made in strengthening public safety measures. But unfortunately, there are reports that criminal activity like auto theft, illicit drug trafficking are more widespread and have increased in sophistication. Another disturbing trend being seen all across Ontario is just how quickly firearms can be purchased in the U.S., smuggled into Canada, and used to, make, to commit criminal offences here. That's why it's important for our police officers to have the tools and resources they need to tackle this new level of organized crime. It's negatively impacting our province. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how our government is increasing measures that will support police services as they combat complex, organized crime? And to reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member. You know, we know that almost every gun that's used in an illegal activity in our province emanates from across the border. And that's why in 2020, Ontario launched a multi-year guns, gangs and violence reduction strategy through which we've invested over $203 million. Our strategy focuses on prevention, intervention and enforcement. And yes, as I said just a second ago, because the, the firearms are coming from across the border, we're continuing to urge the federal government. This is the message I said last week in Bromont, Quebec, when I was there together with the Attorney General at the, at the FPT meeting, that the federal government has to step up border protections. I said to my counterpart, meet me at the border so you can see for yourself. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The Minister of Education has a point of order. Very briefly, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to recognize that in question period, a member of Sija, Sahavi Zeinelberg, joined us, and I want to thank him for his leadership on behalf of all Israelis and all victims. Government House Leader. On Standing Order 59. Uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you very much uh, Mr. Speaker. Just rising on Standing Order Number 59, outline the uh, uh, status of business for next week and to uh, thank colleagues for a productive week. Uh, as you uh, announced earlier, Mr. Speaker, we will be returning Monday morning at 9 uh, a.m. Uh, and we will be seized with Government Order Number 39, which of course is a censure motion for the member for Hamilton Centre. Uh, um, in the afternoon, we will have an opposition day debate. 
uh, opposition day number three and bill 135 uh, which is convenient care at home act uh, in the morning of tuesday october 24th we will uh, move to bill 135 again the convenient care at home act and in the afternoon we will be moving to bill 65 standing in the name of the member for whitby which is the honoring our veterans act uh, in the evening we will have private members motion number 65. on wednesday october 25th in the morning we will continue with the uh, the honoring our veterans act in the name of the member for whitby in the afternoon uh, we will be seized with a, uh, a member for chatham kent leamington a private members motion number 69 uh, which is a carbon tax on groceries uh, motion. Uh, in the evening, uh, we will be debating uh, uh, Bill 38. On Thursday, October 26, in the morning, uh, we will be debating, in the morning and in the afternoon, we will be debating a government bill which will be introduced later on today. And in the evening, we will be on no notice of motion, uh, private member's motion number 66. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next, we have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on Government Order Number 38 relating to the Hamas attacks. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. 